Hello, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Roy Henderson, the uh, Mind and Safety product owner with BZ. And uh, welcome to tonight's BZ Avalanche Safety presentation. Thank you very much for giving up your time to be at the presentation. Although I suspect none of you were, were heading to APRE at the moment, given the, uh, the COVID regime that we live in. Um, I do hope, uh, pertinent to that, that, that you are all safe and well. And uh, it's it's wonderful to, to see so many people at the talk tonight. Um, we plan to take about an hour um, to go through things and at strategic times during the talk, we'll, we'll pause for questions. Um, some questions can be answered just by by me typing during the talk uh, and others will will pause and answer uh, in this format where you can see me. The bulk of the actual talk will be delivered by Andy Townsend. Uh, Andy delivers courses for Basie, is a, an international mountain guide and uh, very, very nearly a Basie level three ISIA. Um, Andy is uh, currently doing quite a lot of work with the, the Scottish Avalanche Information Service um, and we've got some fantastic conditions here in Scotland, uh, albeit it was about minus 15 this morning when I clicked on my touring skis. But uh, so Andy will be delivering the bulk of the talk. I'll be coming in with questions and uh, monitoring that side of things. The talk is aimed at educating you, the listener, with regards to avalanche safety. The talk is aimed, uh, the idea is that we'll give information and uh, tips and, and help at all levels and all disciplines. We appreciate that some of you may know a fair bit already um, and some of you may be coming at this knowing very little. The idea is that it's generic. There, there should be something in the talk for everyone, whether that's confirmation of information you know already or, or new stuff. Um, please remember as well that avalanche forking, forecasting is very like weather forecasting. It's not an exact science. The meteorologists quite often get it wrong um, and indeed avalanche forecasting is very difficult to get 100% all of the time. There are very few exacts there are very few rules and specific things that we can say if A happens, B always happens. If C happens, D always happens. So please bear that in mind. And I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm merely being honest. The, the whole process is quite a, a grey area, but we'll, we'll attempt to try to clarify that as best we can. We'll attempt to try to impart the knowledge that we've got during the talk and I guess this is part of a jigsaw puzzle for all of you. Uh, the avalanche forecasts, the information you can glean from books, from friends, from maps uh, and so on will go to augment everything that's in this talk. So try to get as much information as possible before making decisions. The talk's going to contain a section about snow and avalanche types. Uh, and the conditions which can lead to those types of snow or, or types of avalanches forming. Uh, it's going to discuss and illustrate the European Avalanche Warning Service key avalanche problems. We'll then look at triggering avalanches and, and how avalanches are triggered. And uh, we'll leave you with a a bit of an information about travelling in avalanche terrain, so um, safe travel or safer travel in avalanche terrain. Um, just a, a couple of statistics that, that may be of, of interest. 93% um, of avalanche victims, of avalanches, are triggered by the victim or the victim's group. 93% of avalanches are triggered by the victim or victim's party. So to that end, we know the enemy and the enemy is us. Our chances of survival if buried in an avalanche reduce significantly by up to 80% in the first 15 minutes. So we know the rescuer and the rescuer is us or our party. Anyway, on that note, I'll hand across to Andy who will start the talk and the presentation and I will 
appear at some stage later to answer questions. Enjoy. Great, thank you, Roy. Um, welcome to talk. We're going to chat a little bit about snow and, and avalanches, as Roy said. Um, I'm going to make a confession and an apology. Um, I have lots of photos of people skiing and avalanches taken whilst I work on a pair of skis. I am lacking snowboard photos. So my New Year's resolution is that I'm going to go ski with more snowboarders to take more pictures so I can have a balanced photo library. Um, and if folk have really good photos of avalanches and snowboarders, please, I would love to get hold of those and I can use them in the talk. Um, we are talking about snow and, you know, I've I've been geeking out over snow for a long time. Um, I'm not very good at anything else, but I am quite good at geeking out and, and knowing lots of snow related facts. But I guess one of the things we should be we should have in the back of our mind is that as, a, as the human race, we've spent more money making cars go faster than we have studying snow or a substance that dominates almost half of our sea, of our year. For us as ski instructors and snowboarding instructors, it's the key thing. You know, without it, we can't do our job. But you know, when you look at this photo and you see you see one of one of Bayes' trainer, uh, mountain safety trainers, Kenny Grant, having some nice turns through some light fluffy powder you don't see any of the dangers. You don't see any of the mechanics or the physics that are going on underneath that surface. And, and in this, snow is the most amazing material on the planet. It's water, but it's not just water. It, it's within that snowpack. Now there are, there are solids, there is vapor, and there is liquid. It is material in all three states all at the same time, all below freezing. There is no other substance on the planet that can do stuff like that. And it's that complexity that makes avalanches so difficult to predict, to understand, and ultimately to avoid. There are four main classifications of avalanche. And I guess like all frontier sciences, Every country has its own experts and every one of those experts likes to argue with other experts from other countries about their particular type of snow. But what we can agree on around the world is that there are these four main classifications of avalanche. If we start, we're not going to start in any logical order. There have been and there will always be powder cloud avalanches. They are very rare. However, this winter, I know in, in the Alps, we've seen quite a few of them. Um, if we go back in history to some major events like the avalanche at Mont Rock in 1999 and Galtur in Austria, it was powder cloud avalanches that destroyed villages, ripped houses out of their foundations. And it wasn't necessarily the snow that was doing that, it was the air blast that the snow created by coming down the mountains incredibly fast. But we see those very, very rarely. What we see a lot more of are loose, avalanche, loose snow avalanches and wet snow avalanches. And the one that will be the main problem for us as, as skiers and snowboarders is the slab avalanche. If you're going to concentrate on one aspect, it's the slab avalanche because, as Roy said, you know, with 93 percent of victims triggering their own or being triggered by their friends, almost all of those will be in some form of slab avalanche. Loose snow avalanches, um, you can describe those as sloughs. Um, slough is quite a casual term. A slough is an avalanche. Let's be open and honest and say we're managing the avalanche on that slope. We're not managing a slough, we're managing the avalanche. A loose snow avalanche can be dry, it can be wet. 
in later spring, we're obviously going to see the wet snow avalanches. They're slightly slower moving and they travel a lot, a lot further than people think. But again, we come back to the slab avalanche and we can have wet slab, we can have dry slab, we can have old slab, new slab. It can be soft slab or like this current wind slab we have in, in Scotland, it's actually so hard you can't put a probe through it. But when you dig into it or dig underneath it, it's sat on a bed of faceted grain, so it's lethal. But at the moment, it's so dense, it's bridging the problem. We, we're very lucky in Britain and, and in the Alps that um, we're still part of the European Avalanche Warning Services Group. And this is a, a, a body that is, is trying to keep and standardise avalanche terminology, avalanche forecasting, avalanche prediction and, and avalanche management. And they're doing that across most of Europe so that as Brits, we travel and we're avalanche tourists. So being able to travel from the UK to France, Switzerland, Italy, Austria or wherever, we will see a standardised avalanche forecast and explanation. And that's what we have here. We have five key avalanche problems and these have been agreed by all the all the contributing nations of the EAWS. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to go through these five key avalanche problems and have a little look and a chat about the unique properties of each of them. Now, before I go any further, I'm actually going to go through six key avalanche problems. The European Avalanche Warning Service has only five, but the UK and Canada add a sixth, which is cornices. So we're going to look at that. So before you start messaging in saying, Andy, you, you can't count, there are six, but the European Avalanche Service only has five. You'll see as we go along. So we're going to start off with this one. This is this is new snow or as the North Americans call it, this is your storm slab. And I guess storm slab tells us exactly what it is. It's a slab, a cohesive layer of snow that's fallen during a storm or a recent snow event. It isn't going to last very long before it starts to bond and integrate with the layers that it's fallen on top of. But while it's in, while we're very recent to that snowfall, it is incredibly soft and it lacks cohesion between it and the bed surface or the old snow. They can be very, very easily triggered. These can always you can also take these as, as sloughs, is, is a popular term for them. Um, but the slough can also then start a chain reaction within the surface of the snow that ultimately leads to a bigger area breaking and that can become your slab. Um, they're very prone to both natural and human triggers. And probably we see far more human triggers now than we do uh, natural ones. Uh, it's going to be very widespread over the whole mountain and a, very, and a lot of aspects and a lot of elevations and altitudes because it's associated with that storm event. It's probably where the, where the sort of urban myth that you shouldn't ski for 24 hours after snowfall comes from because within that 24 hours, 48 or 36 hours, that is when that new layer is bonding to the next layer underneath it, or it's having more layers put on top of it. And it is quite, um, although it's very soft, it's quite easy to ski through. It's very difficult to identify because it doesn't, there's no density changes. There's no color in their difference. You're just skiing along through soft snow. But what it is, is very common that this will tr be triggered by skiers or boarders. And if it's triggered in the right sort of terrain, it can lead to burials or skiers being knocked off their feet 
and washed into trees or through rocks. So it is quite a hazard for us. Of course, the way to manage that is just to not go skiing till the snow settles. But then you don't, you'll miss the fresh turns, you'll miss the powder, the thrill of, of skiing untracked snow. So skiing untracked snow means you have to accept a greater risk and, it, and work with storm slab. Our next key avalanche problem is wet snow. And it would be very easy to go back through meteorological records and find out what time of year and what point in the season most wet snow avalanches occur. But certainly what I've seen in the last 10, 15 years as I've been working as a guide is that I see wet avalanches earlier and earlier in the season. January is no longer the coldest month of the year. We can have wet snow in January as well as we can in April or May. Um, it involves liquid and this is the point at which um, that water vapour that exists within the snowpack or the solid generates and produces liquid. And when it produces enough liquid, that dissolves the bonds that hold the snow grains together. It could be rain because we often get now, we're getting storms and certainly this winter in the Alps, we've had rain events that have put rain down at higher elevations than most people have ever remembered. And it's that rain, the moisture from warming and melting that dissolves those bonds and it triggers. They are incredibly disruptive destructive and as you can see from this image they can take out whole mountainsides and they're not just snow sliding down they're ripping rocks out and bringing down soil and earth and dirt and trees and all sorts of stuff. Um, these are mainly natural triggered events although obviously this is one that was triggered by a skier and the skier just caught them on caught this wet soggy snow at the right point on the right steepness and caused a little bit of a slide. Now maybe this slide isn't big enough to to be thought of as dangerous or fatal but it is enough to break your legs, it is enough to trap you and bury you in the snow and this stuff is so wet and so dense that your survival rate is less than that 15 minutes that Roy mentioned right back at the beginning. The good news is that they are predictable. Um, if you travel early in the day, you're most likely to avoid the, the strong daytime temperature increase that is often the trigger for these avalanches. Then that, having said that, there are of course exceptions to the rule and they can start at any time, at any point in the day. Um, they will travel on very low angles. Norway is, is documented wet snow avalanches traveling on one degree slopes. You know, barely perceivable as actually having a slope, but the, pu the material pushes itself along and more material is brought in, produces more momentum, more inertia, and it keeps traveling. So these are incredibly destructive and also not very good to skin across or ski across as, as you can see. Our next um, avalanche problem is what what is sort of it's quite a nice name these are glide cracks. Um, the Germans have a much more vigorous name for this. Um, it is essentially it's the whole snowpack leaving the hillside behind. Um, as the snowpack warms and cools through the season, it gets more and more dense. The layers become more and more uniform. And at some point, the weight of the snowpack overpowers the friction of the bed surface that it's sat on. And, you know, it, it's a common held belief that grassy slopes, meadows, pastures are going to produce glide cracks. They do. But it will also, you can also produce glide cracks on melt freeze layers within the snowpack. So they're not just full depth avalanches. And, you know, 10 years ago, we would tell you that 
avalanche glide crack avalanches were a springtime phenomenon and that was it you didn't have to worry about them in january but when you look at this photo from from austria the valley is in full depth winter the snow in the fields there shouldn't in springtime there wouldn't be snow in those fields and here we have full depth avalanches generating and building stuff you can see how the whole slab is starting to move January last year, if any of you were, were around Val d'Isere, they had a glide crack avalanche that threatened one of the nice beginner runs in Val d'Isere. And they ended up bringing the firemen in to pump water into these cracks in order to try to trigger the slope and get it off because explosives wouldn't do that. Um, when do they go? We don't know. What are the triggers? almost certainly natural, hum a, human, a human's weight on there might not be enough to trigger it, or it might be enough to trigger it. We just don't know. And the, the Swiss government consider these such a problem that they've asked the Swiss Avalanche Foundation to research them. And they've given them 200 million Swiss francs in order to run a study on glide cracks because we know so little about the triggering mechanism of the mechanisms of them. We're going to come on to, like I said, slabs are the ones that we need to be most interested in. Um, persistent weak layers, and this is what Scotland currently has, um, more like a phrase you'd hear in, from the Alps, but currently Scotland has um, a very persistent wheat layer that is is causing some concern. It is, as it says, it is a weak layer within the snowpack. But I want you to imagine or, or think that weak layer is not that weak because it can support an awful lot of snow on top of it. It can support up to metres and metres of it. What it is, is a very vulnerable layer, a vulnerable layer to additional loading or some form of shock load is, is really the key to it. It's most commonly associated with faceted grains. That's the square shapes you see on the avalanche reports. And we can we can go as far as to say it's m within Europe it's most commonly associated with depth hoar, buried depth hoar, buried surface hoar, or the French call them goblet crystals. They're very beautiful, very pretty, and they're like champagne glasses. They're very strong till you knock them or, or impact them, and then they break and fail. These layers exist within the snow, and they are changing. If the snowpack is quite shallow, <clears throat> has a source of moisture and a temp is very, very cold, it will draw that moisture from the ground through to the surface. And as it's doing that, it is growing bigger and bigger crystals and grains. They will they will exist. These are the sorry, these are the depth hall crystals here. And you can see, I mean, this is a photo taken on the glove, on my glove. I didn't need a magnifying glass to do this. They're very big, like I said, they're very pretty, but they are deadly. They can exist in the snowpack through melt-free cycles with almost no change, which makes them incredibly resistant and hardy. And therefore, the persistent weak layer is a long-term problem. You often get these in early season and they will remain buried until the right trigger. Now, this isn't my photo. Uh, I got this from a, from a colleague. You can see how well skied those slopes are. You can see a piece. And yet there's a slab has broken out on a very, very smooth bed surface. Now, we don't know where the trigger was for this. Uh, I don't know the history of it. And I don't even know where this is. But just its proximity to a piece and the amount of snowboard ski traffic over the surface of it would lead me to believe that was a, a stable slope and underneath 
maybe a meter, maybe two meters down, was this weak persistent layer. And when the optimum conditions for its failure happened, this is what what the this is what it produced. So these are almost certainly always triggered by humans. Could potentially be triggered by cornice collapse, but not very often. We next come on to um, probably the most Scottish problem we have, which is wind drifted snow. Um, yes, you get winds in the Alps and yes, you get wind slab, but you don't get winds like we do in Scotland. Ours are much more ferocious than yours. And the qu sheer quantity of snow that can be moved in no time at all is, is gobsmacking. This avalanche, 12 hours or 24 hours before this photo was taken, there was almost no snow on this slope. And in 24 hours, it took all the snow from the Cairngorm Plateau and basically piled it up onto this slope. And when this triggered, it definitely caught the two skiers that triggered it by surprise. They were, they weren't buried, they weren't carried very far, but you can see how dense those slabby blocks are. Um, it is good, nature is quite handy, to, is quite kind to us with wind slab in that it gives us clues. Often we will see these sort of cracks, you'll often hear things like woomphing as the snowpack settles, as that wind slab cracks. And where the wind, where the wind has taken the snow from, will have lots of surface texture. So this sort of sastrugi that you'll see in the Norwegian fells is what you'll get on the mountains as well. And that's the snow eroding it, just like a tide traveling over a beach moves the sand grains. The wind behaves just like a fluid, picks up those grains and tra transports them, packs them into the sheltered slopes and leads to some very big slabs. And these big slabs can be triggered both by humans and naturally. So they're the, probably the hardest to, to recognize apart from when you see these clues. You look at this slab here, um, this is above Zinal in Switzerland. Um, there's, there's lots of clues to what to the existence of this wind slab. The ridge on the right hand side of the image is scoured and rocky. There's a wind lip. There's some very smooth snow and some very textured snow. And if you look at the, the ski tracks on the right hand side, they're not nice tracks. Yet to get to this place, to ski that face, you would have to be a good skier. So they struggled with that snow. It was crusty. It was not friendly. And therefore, it was it was wind slab. And then when this triggered, it was triggered in the initial shallow wind slab and the weight of that wind slab then triggered a bigger, deeper layer. And unfortunately, it then swept over those rocks that were well hidden. Uh, nobody was killed in that one. They were very lucky, um, but it could have been a lot worse for them. Then that was the five key avalanche problems that, that Europe refers to. We're just going to quickly talk about cornices because that is a, a UK phenomenon that we have. And also Canada have that in their list of, of key avalanche problems as well. You don't always get cornices this big and it's pretty unadvisable to go and stand and post the photos directly underneath. But Essentially, they build on the leeward side and they build on the lip or a very uh, drastic change in the ground. So where you get a plateau and you get a steep edge or a ridge, the lee side will build a cornice. Um, they're almost unpredictable to, to tell you when that would collapse, except the more snow that is added to it adds more weight and because it's hanging on to itself and is overhanging, well, ultimately it will crack and fail. 
Um, it could be a human presence that triggers them. Or worst case for, for us as, as, as travellers or tourists in the mountains is that when the weather's bad or the light is flat, we can't see them, we might ski off them. Of course, you might decide to ski off them, which is good sport in Scotland and it, it definitely makes good photos. But what you need to be aware of is that where you see a cornice, there will be a scarp slope and the scarp slope is a deep pillow of wind slab that builds up underneath the cornice. So what you're going to jump off and land on is wind deposited snow. So it takes you straight back to the wind slab of the previous problem. And then we're going to stop there. And Roy, have we got any questions? So I'm assuming that uh, everybody can see me. I, I hope you like that picture of me hucking that cornice there. I was uh, quite nervous, but you know, I, I got there. Um, we do have one question, um, which I have answered uh, for the people asking it, but it may be worth sharing. And that was just so somebody was asking if the that apparently has been a layer of sand, I presume a Sahara dust storm, um, which quite often happens in this. Uh, it falls sometimes during the night uh, within the snowpack and it, it's pretty obvious. Um, they were asking if that was a concern. Is that layer of sand within the snowpack, does it have the potential to, to be of concern? Um, I've answered that it's very, very unlikely. The chances are that that's so thin that it, it, it doesn't have a concern. Um, it's not a problem with regards to avalanches. If it's a thicker layer, it may be. Um, if it was on the surface, what it may do is heat up at a different rate to the snow. Um, if you can sometimes if you've ever seen a rock sitting in the snow um, and, it, and it sinks into the snow during the day as the darker material reflects the or, or absorbs the heat more than the reflective snow around about it. So that may uh, give rise to changing conditions, but I wouldn't be concerned about the, the sand layer. Uh, it's a very useful tool to date the snowpack. Uh, you can you can tell exactly when it fell uh, and look at the layers above it and below it uh, and date it very precisely within the snowpack. I, I just wanted to uh, add one other thing, and that was um, it, Andy left us wondering what the uh, what the German word for glide cracks was. So that's a fischmoll, or a, a, a excuse pronunciation if there are German speakers out there. A fischmoll, a fish's mouth. And interestingly, the French call it a bouche de baleine, uh, which is a whale's mouth. So there you go. Uh, probably irrelevant, but uh, I thought I would add that. No further questions at the moment, so I'll hand back to you, Andy. Thank you. Excellent. Right. So we're going to look at triggering mechanisms. So, you know, the, the key avalanche problems uh, are good because we know a little bit more about the enemy. Now we want to know a little bit more about what makes the enemy work or how it how it ticks. Obviously, that isn't my photo. I've gratuitously stolen that off the web, but this is an educational purpose, so there's no copyright infringement, I believe. Um, but let's go to this photo. So, you know, um, avalanches need um, one thing to travel, and that is gravity and gravity will increase as we steepen the slope. It, it's pretty simple, really. If if you get if you become a talented uh, snowboarder or skier on two degree slopes, you can have a lot of fun in a lot of safety. But that isn't where we like to go. We like to ski more terrain, steeper terrain. Some people like to ski very steep terrain. The steeper you go, the less the avalanche risk because gravity won't allow the snow to build up to any significant level or depth. The shallower we go, the less likely for a blocky slab avalanche to have enough momentum to overpower the friction bonds and slide. 
Remember that wet snow avalanches can travel right down at that one, two degrees level. They don't they don't care about this. Um, cornices will collapse off much steeper terrain. They can land on 45 degree slopes and trigger it. From a from a you know a snowboard skiing point of view, then the bullseye angles that we need to be most concerned with is 30 to 45. If you're a statistician, then I, I, I believe that the last piece of research on that came out that it was 38.25 degrees is statistically the most likely angle for you to trigger an avalanche on. Um, basically, it's anything from 30 to 45. And as you'll see when we talk a little bit later, that is also going to change and you need to consider not just the slope angle you're on but the slope above you the slope below you and the slopes around you the next the next sort of common triggering point of view are, are on convexities and when you get you know th there is no such thing as a uniform slope or uniform snow depth it's, it's going to change and be varied all over the place and where that snow is bent over a rounded terrain feature, it will be under tension. And where it's under tension is most likely where it won't have the strength within the snowpack to support an additional load. And that's most likely where it will fail. But convexities are complicated. And sometimes we look at those and they're very big, obvious, plateau to slope changes, the macro scale of your navigation. But sometimes they're also micro. You can see from, from here where I've put lots of red arrows on, these are all convexities in one area. Some of them are very big and obvious. Some of them are actually mid-slope. And you need to constantly be evaluating your route choice. Sometimes rocks can form convexities, so it doesn't even need to be the ground or the bed surface that changes. It can be the rocks that change these things as well. And concavities, the opposite, the snow is under compression. Now that means it's unlikely to break, but it's very good at transmitting the force along the snowpack to a convexity. So essentially, we've got to be a lot really careful about finding an area on the slope to stop. Now, obviously, skiers tend to stop on the flats. Snowboarders, you like to stop on the downward slope so you've got somewhere to stand up and get going. For snowboarders, you often end up stopping on those convexities, which is, I'm not going to say you shouldn't do that, but you need to do that with some consideration for your own safety. So when I said about additional load and and this is the key to it, you know, I want you to imagine, you know, as those of you that know me, how strong and muscular I am and I'm going to get a, a bar and I'm going to put some weight on it and I'm going to squat it and, and thrust it up and hold it above my head. I'm the snowpack and I can hold, I don't know, 80 kilos above my head. If, if Roy comes along and he adds another 20 kilos on each side, that's 120 kilos, my knees are going to start to buckle. Maybe they add 40 kilos on each side and I get to 160 kilos, my knees will buckle and eventually I won't be able to hold that weight up. Think of that the other way around now. We have a snowpack and we're going to put weight into it. And at some point, that snowpack will be overpowered and it will fail. As we're traveling around as a skier, then we influence our weight, our um, force travels into the snowpack. Now, it's not as simple as this drawing that I've done because speed is definitely a factor. Snow density is definitely a factor. Style of the skier is definitely a factor. Bigger turns, maybe less force. Um, tighter old school turns, 
a little bit more force. Falling over and taking a wipe out, a lot of force. They are, some of the research leads us to believe that if that skier was to do a full face plant and flick flack down the slope, that initial impact has enough to influence four meters into the snowpack. Having said that, you know, that skier is influencing to two meters, it's really the, meet, the first meter or meter and a half is where we have the most influence. So here is, here is my skier traveling along. There is their force, their influence, the, the weight traveling into the, into the snowpack. And that white layer is a weakening within the snowpack. Now that could be wind slab. It could be uh, a, a smooth bed surface. It could be the weak persistent layer. At some point, that weak layer is going to collapse and it will collapse vertically first. There's the vertical collapse. Now that is a triggered avalanche, but it hasn't actually produced anything yet. What will happen is that vertical collapse will spread horizontally or laterally and it will keep going and it will keep spreading that layer will keep collapsing till the slab can no longer support its own weight plus the weight of the group or the skier and then it will shear vertically and then you will have your slab sliding on that slope um, that that means that all avalanches that we trigger, slabs in particular, have three stages of failure. They fail vertically, they fail horizontally, and only when they shear vertically in the third stage do we become aware of that avalanche. Which means, and unfortunately, this takes a bit of getting, well, certainly took me a long time to get my head around it, we never know how many avalanches we trigger because we only get we only know the avalanches that we've triggered when we see the vertical shear, which means we could spend our days traveling around the mountains, having a great time triggering avalanches everywhere we go. Either the slope isn't steep enough or the conditions for that weak layer to fail outwards weren't there in the snowpack. And one of the bits of research that's that's coming a lot more, and you know, when we talk about avalanches, it's really hard not to talk about fatalities. So I apologize for that. And I am trying to stay as positive and give you as much good stuff as I can. But every so often there is a an incident that leads to some really good research and some good changes in behavior. And this is a, an, an avalanche that occurred in, I think, 2012 or 2015. I can't remember exactly. And it was a really sad one because the group was buried. They triggered the avalanche that buried them from over a kilometre away. So their presence in the gully or the riverbed at the bottom of this slope was enough to collapse that vertical layer to trigger the lateral failure and that traveled up the slope and it then broke right at the top of the slope produced thousands and tons of material and that swept down into the gully and very sadly buried the this group now i said that you know when we're skiing and boarding we're influencing a meter into the snowpack just look at the, that's a three meter avalanche probe and it doesn't come anywhere near that slab. This is the crown wall at the top of the slab that, that's failed. This is in Kashmir in India and Kashmir is famous for two things, huge snowfall and massive winds. So this is a massive windstorm that came in, moved and packed in four meters plus of snow in the leeward slopes. And when it cleared, um, it was human triggered in a much, much shallower part of the mountain. And that horizontal failure traveled 24 kilometers 
and it went around the compass 270 degrees. It was triggered on a south slope. It went through the east facing slopes onto the north facing slopes and produced some gargantuan amount of, of debris. So these are incredible um, destructive avalanches, but from us, the take home message is we can trigger something at our feet or, or and we'll get the failure can be anywhere around us. It can go below, it can go above, it can go sideways. If you're skiing two people together, your mate might trigger an avalanche that takes you. You don't know. Right. Uh, any questions on that, Roy? That's hello, hi. Um, so I've just been been monitoring the the, the questions there. Um, again, I'm answering the questions as they come in. Um, one that may be worth sharing is uh, someone was asking if ski width would have uh, an effect. So a narrower ski would probably have more penetration into the snow uh, and potentially a greater depth of penetration. So the um, diagram that Andy showed with the sort of pulse coming out from below the skier, that may well be a deeper penetration with a narrower ski. But in reality, with, with most modern skis, it, it's not going to make a vast difference. I certainly wouldn't get hung up on millimetres here and millimetres there. But clearly, if you've got someone on an old pair of, uh, an old pair of hippie sticks, it's really long, narrow skis, then yes, they may have uh, more, more penetration than a, than a wider ski. Um, they certainly may lead to a different style of, of, of skiing as well. But, but I certainly wouldn't get too hung up on that. I, I think it's safe to say, Roy, that fat skis are safer. So yes. from a safety point of view, we all need to go fatter. We've got, um, I'm just going to keep working my way down here. Um, hi, with avalanches that are triggered but do not shear, could they be dormant and trigger shear later? And can, can the snow recover after you're no longer putting pressure on it? Generally speaking, if if we've triggered something, then it, it's had its moment. It's unlikely to go again. But there are so many, as I said at the start, I, I'm not going to say never. Um, it, it may, but there would need to be some form of change in conditions for that slope to become dangerous again. Once it's been triggered, it's the, 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 you know, the, it's unlikely to go again. Um, is it better to ski in each other's tracks in a danger zone, allowing each pair of, allowing each pair of skis compresses? Um, yes, it is better to ski in each other's tracks. Well, what, what we quite often do though, is, is one person might ski above the other just a little bit, and you can get a feel for the snow and gauge how easily that snow is cracking. There'll be some slides coming up in a bit that will show that, but how the snow might crack um, in, in front of your skis. What, what I would say though, I would be less hung up on that and more uh, spacing out. So in that example, I would, I would space out further as a group rather than being so fixed on each other's tracks, but certainly for skinning or traversing, the same tracks works well. Um, Andy, I'll probably have to pass this one to you. How did they identify an avalanche from 24 kilometres away? Uh, 24 kilometres long, but... Yeah, uh, the, they got very close to it because they went uh Kashmir the American Avalanche Association has a training program in Kashmir for the local guides and they do forecasts and they do training and any incident like that is they go out and and do an assessment to learn from it so they went to see it the if you like the slab the crown wall where the slab broke that was 24 kilometers long 
And I think that's probably one of the biggest avalanches I've ever heard of. Um, you know, when you look at things like the super big powder cloud avalanches, it's really hard to find the crown wall, the top of that slope that's gone, because that's just a big body of, of material moving downhill. OK, um, next question. Do trees not help in stabilisation of wind slab? Are tree scattered, scattered slopes a good option for days with high wind slab risk? Which is a, a, a great question. We, we often see a tree or a rock or something like that as being a, an area of stability. Um, clearly stood on the rock up the tree, then we're, we're not loading the snowpack. But quite often the snowpack can be can be shallower the closer you get to the trees the snowpack can be shallower the closer you get to a rock more chance of a possibility of depth or gobbly forming um, so it can provide a trigger point so certainly being within fairly dense trees is a, a much safer option in a high avalanche risk but open clearings within the trees areas where the trees are more scattered, I would still be very wary uh, in those conditions. Uh, also, the, the trees are actually perforating the slab. You remember the slab is, you know, it, it, it's a dense, cohesive unit and it will support a lot of weight. If we put holes in it, it will support less weight. The trees, the rocks sticking through are holes. And if it triggers, it will often unzip from those weak points, those holes to the next hole. So you can certainly have, sometimes you can see slabs in spaced trees and they unzip themselves along the tree line. So, that, so unfortunately, they don't add stability. They add you, they give you a visual reference, which makes it easier to ski in bad weather. Folks, in in order that we can manage time, what I'll do is carry on answering the questions in the background and let Andy crack on with the talk um, because we, we do appreciate that uh, we, we are starting to get short of time. So let's, uh, Andy, I'll hand back over to you and I'll just keep typing away in the background. Cool. So we want, we want to have a long and prosperous lifetime of riding in, in the backcountry. Um, so we're going to we're going to look at some safe travel techniques. Now, um, I don't like the word safe because safe is a constant. It's it's a binary thing. You're either dangerous or you're safe. In the outdoors, we manage risk. Therefore, perhaps this slide should say less risky travel techniques. You never eliminate an avalanche risk. There is never zero rating. So we're, we're going to have a look at some low risk travel techniques. So the first one, and, and this is good because one of the things I like about working for Bayesley is I get to go and, and ride with really good boarders and skiers and, and it's a treat. So have the skills to tackle the slope or the itinerary or the plan for the day. You know, it's dead simple. If you can ski and you can ski well and not necessarily having to ski fast or big turns or small turns, just not falling over is the key. At no point do we want to be falling over because it looks bad. Uh, I hate getting snow down my jacket. More importantly, we stop in the middle of a slope and all slopes are avalanche prone. So not stopping there is, is a good idea. So have the good, have good skills, be ready for that challenge. Don't go for something you're not ready for. Um, by far and away, the best way to avoid an, an avalanche of any sort is with navigation. You know, um, Alain Duclos, who's, who trains the French guides, he, he's an avalanche expert, he's in charge of the uh, avalanche control for the whole of the Savoie. His three top tips to avoid avalanches is navigation, navigation and navigation. 
the map has more information on it than you'll ever need. It will tell you exactly what the slope is, what sort of bed surface it is, what aspect it faces, how high you are on it, and how steep or how shaped that terrain is. So having the right sort of navigation skills to read the slopes so that you don't get lost, you don't stray onto the slopes you don't want to be on, is really important. And on a day like this, it's really, really pleasant to get the map out and identify summits and, and check the slope that you're looking at. And just, it's, it's nice to look at a map. It's less nice when it's like this. And to be good at navigating in bad weather, unfortunately requires lots and lots of knowledge and judgment. And the only way to get that knowledge and judgment is to go and have horrific bad experiences. Good judgment is the product of surviving bad judgment. So you need to get out and you need to practice. And the key thing to remember is we're not doing this on foot. Everything we do, whether we're on board or skis, is going to happen quicker and faster. You're going to travel further than you think. You're going to travel in a different direction, you think. We're always going to be pulled into the full line. It's really hard to travel across, diagonally across the slope or horizontally across the slope. Gravity is always pulling our skis and snowboards into the full line. So again, this needs practice and it needs strategies. There's lots of good electronic devices out there. You get apps for your phones, you get um, handheld devices. There's loads of really good stuff out there to, to help with your navigation. A key word of warning there though, everything that's electronic, everything that you own and carry with you on the hill when you're skiing or boarding that has a battery in it, affects your transceiver. If it's a mobile phone, switching it off doesn't make a difference. If it's a GoPro, it will affect your transceiver's ability to receive a signal and transmit a signal. So make sure you keep all your electronic devices a minimum of 50 centimeters away from your transceiver. So if you wear your transceiver on your chest in a, in a holster, the only place for you to put those devices is in your rucksack. Because if you put them in your trouser pockets and you get buried and folded in half, that GoPro, that mobile phone, the camera, whatever, is folded up next to your transceiver. So get everything 50 centimeters away. We're going to ride the angles. If we play the angles game, we can we can't eliminate the risk, we can reduce it significantly. Now what we have here is, is a table and this is not a rule. This is a bit of advice. It's, it's a suggestion. Please do not take this away. Do not write this down and pull it out and say, oh right, it's, it's level three, it's considerable today. So we're going to stick to 20 to 25 degree slopes, red run angle. This is an idea for you to take away and to think about. And it's an, it's an idea that we can use the piste angles in order to give you some sort of tool for classifying and identifying the backcountry slopes. At low risk, we can go and ski the steeper stuff. At, at moderate risk, we can go maybe a little bit less steep. Bear in mind that 80% of fatal avalanches occur at moderate. They don't occur in considerable and they don't occur in high. 80% of them happen at that moderate level. So even though I'm saying, yes, 30 to 35 black run level, that would be an appropriate type of run. It needs to be managed carefully because there's still a risk of an avalanche. So I like to talk, I like to always in, in my mind go through the three watts. Um, three is the magic number, as we all know. So having three things to constantly think about while you're traveling around. What is happening under my feet? 
and I can tell what's happening under my feet by just whipping out my avalanche probe and pushing it into the snow. I can feel the layers. If they start off soft and slowly get harder, that's a good thing. That's a well-structured, cohesive snowpack. If they start off hard and get softer, or they start off firm and your probe suddenly shoots away from you as you push it in, that is a bad sign. That's a sign that there's a snowpack hanging on an unknown or a weak persistent layer. So if I know what is under my feet, I can modify my ski or riding style to suit that. If I'm pretty confident about the snow, then jumping on, on stuff, jumping off cornices, skiing aggressively. If I'm less confident, go for the shallow slopes, obviously, but also modify your ski style and make sure you don't fall over. The second and third what is very simple, is what is above you and what is below you. If I'm skiing along or riding along and there's big cornices above me and they're in the sun, then expect some debris to come falling down. I've also put on there who is above you and who is below you. We, we are as likely as Roy said to have an avalanche triggered by somebody in our group, but that's not always the case. You might be deciding to ski somewhere and you see some erratic behavior from another group that's unconnected with you. The most sensible thing to do there is to let them go. Let the avalanche poodles go ahead, get them out the way. Don't let them come anywhere near you. If you need to, be aggressive and shout at them. Nothing better than a good slanging match on a powder day. It's going to happen anyway, so you may as well be the instigator. And finally, what you know, what is below you? Are you going to get, if you're skiing that slope and you've made all your good decisions, you're confident in what you're doing, you, you think you're in a good place, and it avalanches, are you going over cliffs? Are you going into trees? Are you going into rocks? Are you going into a gully or a terrain trap that will magnify the depth of the snow? And if you feel uncomfortable, change that plan. Likewise, if you're skiing down and the avalanche poodles are there having a sandwich, then you need to make a decision whether you carry on or wait for them to finish their lunch and move out your way. But far and away, the key thing we can do is to space out. Now, we space out in ascent, we space out in descent, and we sp space out more than we think we should, more than as humans we're comfortable with. You know, skiing and boarding, it's a sociable sport. Riding a slope in good powder with your mate is, is one of the key enjoyments of life. But that mate needs to be far enough away that you're not putting two persons additional load into the snowpack. You're only putting one in. It also means that your rescuers, your buddy, is less likely to be caught in the avalanche that you trigger. So space out. And I su I've suggested 100 meters plus, but you're going to space out to what you feel comfortable spacing out. If you're scared, space out massively. If you're less scared, you can get to shouting distance. If it's if totally comfortable, you maybe get to loud talking distance. But at no point do you get to sharing sweeties distance because it's too close. You need to be patient. You know, patience is a virtue. You need to wait your turn. Um, skiing one at a time, you know, like I said before, it, it goes against the sociable nature of our sport, but it does two things. It reduces that additional load in the snowpack and it keeps the valuable rescue resource safe. So here we've got Chris skiing down. He has got a posse of rescuers above him. So as a, you know, when I'm guiding, I often, you know, as the guide skiing first, do I take the greatest risk? Yes, I do take the greatest risk of being avalanched, but I have the lowest risk because I have the rescuers 
above me. The last man down will have a greater risk. Probably the slope is less likely to avalanche, but it would take longer for the rescuers to reach them. So it's all always to be debated and decided. And then go long. Um, when I started guiding client care, we would make 10 turns, stop, smile and wave, take photos, watch the group come down, collect them together, make another 10, 15 turns. It meant that the group was close. It meant that you could get to somebody and help them back into their skis. Now, my client care is less client care. I'm going to ski this slope top to bottom because there is no island of safety in there. As Roy, and Roy said, the rocks and the trees that stick out of these things, they're not islands of safety. They're actual islands of vulnerability. So don't go near them. So you're going to go long and you're not going to stop and you're going to go way out at the bottom because if this slope was triggered by one of the later skiers, it would run up to three times the height of the slope that it can. So if you've got a slope that's 100 meters high, it could travel 300 meters out onto the flat. So you need to get a long, long way. This slope's way more than 300 meters, 100 meters long. This is like a five, 600 meter drop. So you need to be almost a kilometer away to be out of the run out zone. And it might seem a little bit antisocial, but I say to my clients, if your mate falls over, don't stop. If you fall over on that slope, you're going to have to have the skills to sort yourself out because it's too dangerous to have your mate come and help you get up. Not, not the, so that's not the good client care that, that I like to think I give my clients, but that is how we manage these risks. We need to keep visual contact at all times. There is no excuse for watching the back of your mate's head or helmet go along, look at the snow and then they disappear. If they disappear because they've gone over a convexity, then you are in the wrong place. If it's a uniform slope, then you can stand at the top and watch them ski down. If like this slope, it has a big convexity in the middle of it, then you somebody in your group is going to have to sacrifice themselves. So the circle on the left with the big, big arrow, that was our watcher. We drew straws, we sent, we sent her off there. She stood on that promontory. She could see above the convexity, on the convexity and below the convexity. So she could see the four of us or five of us ski that slope at all times. She's on a promontory. She's safe from the avalanche that we may trigger. So she's a valuable rescue resource. If you lose sight of somebody, it's an unforgivable sin. There is no coming back from that. So we come on to communication. Now, <clears throat> yes, that does mean we need to make a plan and we need to talk about it, but it actually comes down to something much more intrinsic than that. It is about who we are as individuals and how we feel on that day. If you agree to go on a ski tour, to ski a run, but you don't feel 100%, you've not got your A game. You went to the apparet the night before and it was an apparet and you drank more than you felt comfortable with. You got a bit of a hangover. You need to communicate that to the group because that makes you, A, you're gonna ski badly, and B, you're not an effective rescuer. You might be ill, you might be scared, you might feel that you haven't got the skill set to cope with the proposed run that your group, your friends are, are trying to get you to, to ride down. That communication, it, it's difficult to do in, in a peer group. It's really difficult to do in a led or a guided group, but it's essential. Because that need, we need to ski and ride slopes that are fit for the group as the whole, therefore the lowest common denominator, not the highest. And that ability to talk and discuss, do you know, I don't feel right today. I've got a funny feeling about the snowpack. Yes, so do I. I'm not being a wimp. I'm not being a chicken. 
I'm expressing my concerns in an honest and unbiased way. That is, most avalanche experts agree, the best way for us to survive in, in avalanche terrain. And one of the ways we can do that is with a checklist. So we're going to make a plan. You plan the night before, you don't, you find the information out, you find the weather, you find the avalanche conditions out, you make a plan that suits the information you've gathered. Don't make a plan to ski, to ski the colder through and then find the weather that fit allows you to do that because you'll be lured into skiing something you shouldn't. Find the weather, find the information, make the plan that fits. Go as far with your group that you're going to ski with or ride with to decide the aspects of the mountain you're prepared to ski on or not ski on, the elevations that you're going to go on, the angles that you go on. Make a checklist and agree to it. When I can remember when um, I was doing some guide CPD training, we had an avalanche planning session, we were skiing, we said we would not ski northwest slopes above 2000 meters because they were in the in the bullseye for an avalanche. We skied out, we saw some guys ski a northeast northwest slope, it looked amazing. We ummed and heard about jumping in, but it was our checklist that we made that stopped us going in. Just because that group had done it and looked like they had a nice time, didn't change the fact that we'd identified that slope as being vulnerable to avalanche. So having that checklist and sticking to it is by far and away the most powerful tool we have for low risk travel. And I'm going to stop and if we've got any more questions, that's good. And I think I've ranted enough and looking at the time, we're a little bit over, but not hideously. Roy? OK, I, hopefully I've made an, a good stab at answering everybody's questions um, while we've been going. Uh, I don't think there's anything that I, I need um, to pass on to anyone else. I, I think I've managed to answer all those questions. Thank you so much for engaging. Um, it, it's been amazing to, to see the, the number of attendees went up to over 100 and, and it hasn't actually dipped much below that. So I think that's a good sign. People are not leaving. Um, although you probably do want to get to your, your Netflix box sets and so on now. So I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I, I hope it's given you some tips um, and uh, some, some tools and, and knowledge uh, to be safe in the snow. Um, I, as I, I said before, the, the talk has given you some information. Uh, nothing can give you all the information. It's it's some of the information. If if the decision to ski the slope is a bit like making a jigsaw puzzle, until you've got so many pieces in place, you can't make the decision. Then this talk is one piece of that jigsaw puzzle. There are there are so many others. So please um, use the information that we've given you, but gather as much as you possibly can. Um, we do hope to, to be able to do a more advanced version of this talk. Um, so if there is an interest for that, if people do want that, then please let Daisy know and we'll do a, a part two if you like. And if there are further questions, then, then do please submit them to Daisy as well and, and we will try and answer and, and try and help. But for now, I think we'll, um, we'll close the talk there. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Andy for, for his bit, to, to the technical team behind the scenes that are making it work, and indeed to all of you guys who have joined us. Um, be safe, enjoy the mountains, and I'm sure we'll see you again soon.